Okay, good afternoon. My name is Bremila Mali, and on behalf of the World Bank, I would like to thank you all, those who have come from parts of, uh, from parts of India, South Asia, and across the globe, for being part of World Food India 2024 and attending the knowledge sessions thoughtfully incorporated into this mega event. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this important regional dialogue on food systems for enhanced nutrition outcomes. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Your Excellency, the Minister, Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Livestock, Royal Government of Bhutan, Mr. Leonpo Yunten Puncho. Thank you for taking, taking the time to uh, spend with us your valuable time at the Sapling Dialogue. This event is hosted by Sapling, South Asian Policy Leadership for Improved Nutrition and Growth, a platform led by the World Bank and dedicated to advancing nutrition and food systems across South Asia. We are deeply grateful to the Ministry of Food Processing Industries for their partnership in organizing this event and to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for their support. South Asia is at a pivotal moment in shaping its future food and nutrition security. Countries across the region share challenges from malnutrition to climate vulnerabilities. Yet they also share incredible potential for innovation and collaboration. Today, I want to focus on how we can work together to turn these challenges into opportunities, leveraging partnerships and ideas to create a food secure and thriving South Asia. Sapling is a connector for regional collaboration, bringing together key stakeholders to address these critical issues. We believe in the power of a food systems approach, one that doesn't just focus on producing more food, but also on ensuring that the food we grow is safe, nutritious, and accessible to all. At the heart of this mission is the recognition that solutions must be designed and owned by the region itself through leadership and ownership by our governments. Only when these efforts are embedded in national priorities can we achieve the lasting change that we need. South Asia faces some of the most complex nutrition and food system challenges globally. Rapid urbanization, shifting diets, and the escalating impacts of climate change are putting immense pressure on our food systems. Yet countries across the region are rising to these challenges with innovative solutions. In Bangladesh, we see strong government action integrating climate resilience into agricultural policies. In India, digital platforms are being leveraged to connect smallholder farmers to markets, reducing inefficiencies and boosting incomes. In Sri Lanka, nutrition sensitive policies are being designed to improve the diets of vulnerable communities. In Nepal, community driven approaches are being implemented to enhance food security, even in remote and mountainous regions. And in Bhutan, Organic farming and sustainable agriculture are being promoted to improve both environmental outcomes and food security with a focus on nutrition sensitive agriculture. Through Sapling, our goal is to build on these efforts, bringing together key stakeholders to share knowledge, learn from each other, and create innovative partnerships that transcend borders. We believe that sustainable and resilient food systems are key to advancing better nutrition outcomes. Through our collective efforts, we can drive the region toward achieving nutrition security for all. Our work at Sapling focuses on three key areas. First, making agriculture more climate smart. Second, reducing food loss and waste. And third, ensuring the safety of the food we consume. Each of these areas reflects the region's priorities, but they can only succeed with robust collaboration across borders. 
We must ensure that governments lead these initiatives with support from all key innovators, sorry, with support from all key stakeholders, which includes academia, innovators, regional policymakers, micro to macro level practitioners, private sector from large corporations to women-led micro and nano enterprises, international funding agencies, philanthropic institutions, and multilateral organizations. Sapling stands ready to support this vision, not as an external force, but as a facilitator of regional ownership and shared responsibility. Today's dialogue is a step towards creating this shared future. The discussions we have today will shape the direction of Sapling's work in the coming years. Your insights and experiences are vital to our collective success. I encourage you to actively engage in these conversations and to see Sapling as your platform, a space where we can come together as a region to develop solutions and ensure nutrition and food security for generations to come. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you stay with us for the three panels ahead, where distinguished experts will share their perspectives on everything from policy approaches to the role of entrepreneurship in advancing nutrition across South Asia. Thank you. I would now like to turn over the mic to my colleague, Dr. Aparna Somanathan, Practice Manager for Health, Nutrition, and Population for South Asia Region, World Bank. Thank you, Pramila. Good afternoon, honorable ministers, distinguished guests, and valued participants who have gathered here. It's an honor to join all of you today for this critical dialogue on food and nutrition and how we can work together to drive meaningful change for South Asia. At the heart of the Sapling Dialogue is a collective commitment to building stronger, more resilient food systems. Systems that can address the nutritional needs of our population while adapting to the challenges of climate change, economic inequality, and evolving food demand. Today, we have the unique opportunity to bring together insights from policy, research, and practice. We must foster partnerships between governments, the private sector, civil society, and international institutions to ensure that our strategies are effective and inclusive. It's through collaboration that we can scale up impactful initiatives and ensure that no one is left behind. Especially women, children, and marginalized communities who are often the most vulnerable to food insecurity. The Sapling Initiative is a timely and essential platform that seeks to strengthen food systems and make them more resilient, sustainable, and inclusive. In South Asia, where a significant proportion of the population relies on agriculture for livelihoods and nutrition, ensuring robust and secure food systems is vital. These systems must address not only food production, but also ensure that nutrition needs of all, especially the most vulnerable, are met. South Asia is facing a dual challenge of improving food security while enhancing nutritional outcomes. Malnutrition, particularly amongst women and children, continues to affect our region. However, by building stronger, more adaptive food systems, we can make strides towards addressing these nutritional gaps. And this involves embracing innovation, supporting small-scale farmers, improving access to nutritional food, and strengthening safety nets. I will now call upon our eminent speakers of this opening sessions to share their rich insights and perspective with this gathering. Please note that in the interest of time, the bios and profiles of our distinguished speakers will not be shared here, but you can scan them from the QR code provided in the backdrop behind, and you can go through all of their accomplishments and rich expertise. 
I would like to start with the senior representative from the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, SARC, a congregation of eight SARC member states. I call upon Mr. Hari Prasad Odari, Director, Information and Poverty Alleviation, and as the emissary of the SARC Secretary General, to tell us about the regional initiatives taken up by SARC. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Minister, Royal Government of Bhutan, respected Secretary, Government of India, senior government official, senior officials of World Bank and other institution, distinguished guests. I start by thanking Sapling Initiative for the invite. Thank you also for this opportunity to engage in this important dialogue on South Asia food and nutrition. South Asia is home to one fourth of the world's humanity. Despite the overall impressive rate of economic growth in the previous decade, the region still faces the daunting realities of concentration of poverty, underperformance in social indicators, vulnerabilities to natural disaster, and a structural constraint to development of several kinds. South Asia is struggling uh, to ensure food security for a fifth of its population, as per the uh, data. In the latest Global Hunger in Index, most South Asian countries are under the category of either moderate or serious level of hunger, although uh, there are questions about uh, the methodology that I put aside. According to UNICEF, the region is home to one third of the world's undernourished children, and one in five women in South Asia are underweight. The region prides in having a formidable share of young population. This is an opportunity. In the meantime, if we cannot provide the fundamentals, including food and nutrition, the region runs the risk of constraining the growth of an entire generation of a bulk of demography. Over the years, some achievements have been made in the region uh, in the drive to address malnutrition. However, population growth, increasing urbanization, inadequate logistics, as well as threat of climate change and other external factors like war and conflicts, continue to put pressure on food system, pricing and availability. Agriculture is very much climate sensitive, particularly in this region, the disruption of, on the organic bond, ranging from the high mountain ecology to the ocean downward, is serious. Countries in South Asia bear the brunt of the crisis they did not cause, and this has a direct bearing on the, on the status of food and nutrition. Ladies and gentlemen, you may wonder what SARC is doing on the critical sector of food and nutrition security. The organization was established in 1985 with an overarching objective to promote the welfare of its people and to improve the quality of their life. Cognizant of the country's first duty to feed their people, SARC leaders have time and again underscored the importance of regional cooperation in food and agriculture. The 18th SARC summit in 2014, the leaders emphasize to increase investment, promote research and development, facilitate technical cooperation, and apply innovative, appropriate, and reliable technologies in the agriculture sector for enhancing productivity to ensure food and nutritional security for the people. In its first three decades of functioning, SARC developed pretty sophisticated mechanism to foster regional cooperation in agriculture sector. And this includes the agriculture minister's meeting, uh, which aims at policy decision and directive and technical committee on agriculture and rural development. In the non-crop uh, sector, there is a mechanism of chief veterinary officers forum, uh, which remains engaged in addressing the poverty, uh, addressing the priority transboundary animal diseases, 
prevalent in the region. The CBO's forum has, for example, successfully supervised the exchange of high-yielding buffalo jump plasm from India and Pakistan to other SARC members. The CBO's forum is currently working to establish SARC Vaccine Bank and SARC Gene Bank. On institutional front, we have well-functioning SARC Agricultural Center, as well as SARC Food Bank and SARC Seed Bank. Established in 1988, SARC Agricultural Center has turned into Agricultural Knowledge and Information Hub in South Asia. The center is engaged in research, study, expert consultation, workshop, as well as various forms of capacity development in addition to its regular job of information sharing through publications. Established in 2007, SARC Food Bank is expected to act as a regional food security reserve for the SARC member countries during both normal times as well as emergencies and food shortages and provide regional support to national food security efforts. The SARC Seed Bank Agreement was signed in 2011, and its purpose is to provide regional support to national seed security efforts, address regional seed shortages through collective actions, and foster inter-country partnership uh, to promote increase of seed replacement rate. Yet, South Asia faces the challenges of food and nutrition on both fronts of production and access, as well as consumption. On the production front, the region is living with the overarching structural constraint of land availability. South Asia is home to 1.9 billion people in the world, roughly 25% of global population. The share of region in terms of global land is only 4%. The share of global arable land is 14%. This pressure could be one reason why farming in South Asia is dominated by small holdings. This puts serious limitation on mass scale production. Another disadvantage on production side is high dependence on rain-fed farming. Area covered by irrigation falls below 50% of arable land in, in the region. Affordability of agricultural inputs and technology is also a crucial factor. On the consumption side, the main challenge to food and nutrition emanates from wrong or un uninformed choices of consumers. Cultural do's and don'ts also play a part in nutrition intake. While talking about production, access, and consumption, gender aspect becomes important. Women are often primary actors in food chain, from farm to plate. Due to migration and other factors, agriculture in South Asia is witnessing a phenomenon called feminization. Agriculture sector accounts for more than 50% of overall employment in the region, but in women's case, it is more than 60%. It is widely accepted, therefore, that women farmers, if adequately empowered, can significantly contribute to the increased production, as well as household and global food security. Intervention that directly contribute to empower rural women are the critical areas of investment, and such areas may include supporting women-led women farms and cooperative, enabling access to precision farming technology, encouraging women in post-harvest processing, value addition activities, creating platforms, connecting women farmers to market directly, providing financial assistance to women entrepreneurs, and goes on. Distinguished guests, overall, the focus of the countries in the region should therefore be, first, technology. Technology is the prime mover for growth, considering the cost and constraint of other resources, such as land. Genetic enhancement of productivity should be coupled with input use efficiency. Second, seed and other inputs. We need well-developed system for cells and distribution of seeds and plant propagation material, uh, development of competitive and regula regulated seed industry uh, by involving private sector is important. Third, adaptation to climate change. A wide variety of adaptive actions need to be taken to face adverse effect of climate change on agriculture 
is country, first of all, needs to know with some degree of confidence what kind of changes in temperature, rainfall, and other climatic factors it is likely to face. And this would be followed by necessary adaptation and coping of mechanisms. Fourth, supply chain and logistic. Developing efficient supply chain and upgrading transport infrastructure should be a priority in the region. Sar country ought to invest heavily in rural infrastructure that include roads, electrification, irrigation, and markets. Fifth, safety, uh, safety net for the poor. Both rural and urban poor should come under one or other form of uh, social safety net, either direct income transfer or provision of subsidized food. Workers in informal sector should not be left uh, behind. The, the missing link must be filled up. Uh, final and sixth and final food quality. SARC countries need to upgrade and enforce standards, including better sanitary and phytosanitary uh, compliance. Use of uh, pesticides should be better regulated and monitored. Uh, finally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and is part SARC as member states driven organization is committed to reinforce cooperation uh, to upscale the condition of uh, food and uh, nutrition security in the region. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Adari, for those interesting observations on where SARC is headed, as well as efforts to foster regional cooperation in agriculture through SARC. I would now like to invite Mr. Charanjit Singh, Additional Secretary, Minister of Rural Development, to share insights on how the Government of India is advancing nutrition security through food systems and driving progress in rural development. Thank you very much uh, and very warm good afternoon to all. First of all, I would like to respected uh, Minister Bhutan Government, Secretary, Minister of Food Processing Industries, dignitaries on the dais and off the dais. So before I start my sharing of thoughts. I will just give you background that why I'm standing here and with what experience. Basically, I look after this National Rural Livelihood Mission. National Rural Livelihood Mission is a poverty elevation program of the Ministry of Rural Development. What we do, we mobilize one woman from each poor rural household and then we make a self-help group of 10 to 15 women. So, you will be surprised to know that uh, we have got uh, 100 million households who have been mobilized into these self-help groups. So we have uh, around 90 lakh self-help groups. So this is a humongous achievement. No such program exists anywhere in the world and totally dedicated to the woman. So that has been the power of this program. So and as I feel always that uh, Woman knows that how to take care of the family and the children. So this topic of food and nutrition completely matches with the idea of the day NRLM. So that's why when I got the invitation, I thought I will certainly go there and share some of my experiences that how we are working in this direction. And as you all know that, and I would, wouldn't go into the details that what are the figures of uh, malnutrition in India. But I feel there are uh, the, the disease in you know, both sides. There is malnutrition also and there is, is obesity also. So somewhere uh, the people are not getting nutritious food and some the people are taking something which is not nutritious and taking in a large quantity also. So there are, uh, so you may see the figures also. There are so many lifestyle diseases al also in India. So we need to address both issues, the malnutrition also and the issue of the obesity also. So the issue becomes complex also, that how we address this issue. So I feel that here, uh, the this whole structure of the National Rural Livelihood Mission comes into a picture and it can play a great role. Why I'm saying this, I will just give you one more example. We have got, got this community resource persons also. Community resource persons are the basically women from these uh, self-help groups only those who have been trained into specific activities. 
So we call them Krishi Sakis, Pashu Sakis, basically some are experts in agriculture, some are experts in animal husbandry and then we have got this Poshan Sakis also. Those are basically those who are those who are expert in this nutrition related activity. So they can guide the communities very well. So whenever this portion maha or portion pakhwada take place, the NRLM plays a great role in disseminating the knowledge across the country. So that is the strength of this community resource person. So we have got more than 500,000 community resource person. They live in the village, they stay in the village, they constantly interact with the villagers. So the power of communication by them is very strong. So whatever we want to convey, we can convey with them very strongly. And I feel that uh, food, so as you all know that uh, nutritious food is very important. And I feel that in India has got a very strong culture. And we had so many dishes already, but uh, somehow due to the modernization, etc., we were focusing on this pizzas uh, and uh, burgers etc. So I am not saying that th those are bad things. Sometimes you should taste that also. But we should not uh, forget about dishes and we are working in this direction. I will give you just uh, one interesting example. So we hold these food festivals and if you go outside you can uh, see we, we are holding one food festival here also. You can taste the food from 18 stalls which the women have come from various remote corners of India and they are making really ethnic cuisines which are uh, very popular among the customers also. So, so I will request everybody in this room that they, they, they should go to that stall and taste it. And what did we do? So there is one community in uh, Kerala that area is called Attapadi in Palakkad district. So we selected one dish, the, they, they make chicken in a particular way with the local herbs etc. So we just refined it and we trained it and we named it Van Sundari. And then we launched it in Delhi. It became so popular, people loved it. So somehow that stall hasn't come today, but whenever the next time that food festival is held, you should certainly taste that dish also. So what we are doing, we bought the dish from the PVTG community, Primitive Vulnerable Tribal Groups. Those are the standing last in the line. So we bought their dish into the urban metro of Delhi. So they came themselves, they learnt also that uh, what is the demand of the customer in the urban city. So, so it became a win-win situation for them also and for us also. So that is one initiative we took. So I feel that as we involve the community, then there are so many opportunities, so many success stories. And I will give you one more example from that only. Then we, you know that uh, in the forest area, so many tubers occur. But somehow that knowledge is going. So we held one festival, tuber festival only. So we bought the various tubers which are grown in the forest area and the remote areas. And, and, and one exhibition was held and one and several dishes were prepared from those tubers so that the community also came to know that these are the resources available with us and so many things can be prepared by them. So that was also quite hit in. This is also from Kerala only. So this is the way I think if we involve the community and if we take out our traditional dishes, they, they hold so much scope and there are so many opportunities there. And uh, then we focused on this moringa and the millets also. And if you go to that stall, you can see one that jingore ki kheer. Jingora is also a millet from Uttarakhand uh, state and that dish is really tasty, you should taste it. So, and that is very nutritious also, millets are very nutritious. So not only the millets are nutritious, they are climate resistant also. They take less water also. So whatever you want, climate resistance, sustainable, less water and nutritious food, what more do you want? So everything is given by the millets. So we are working on that also. And we are, uh, and, and I am thankful to madam also that uh, we, we are working with the madam, that how to process it. Because growing raw thing is one thing, but you need to process it and take it to the next stage. And some value addition is done, then there is a, 
great market opportunities available. For, uh, for that, we collaborated with them for this uh, Pradhan Mantri formalization of micro enterprises. And uh, so, so, Madam, I am quite happy that every second or third village you go, you will find some women working in this food processing sector. So, that has been a... <laughs> and let me say one more thing. We, so, I feel that to the woman, you need to just show the way. And once she knows the way, she will take it off herself. You don't need to guide her further. So, we started this Pradhan Mantri formalization of micro enterprises. We have uh, established more than 200,000 such enterprises. And some of the women now, they want to go to the next stage. So, we collaborated again and then they have got this one more scheme for the higher order enterprises they, where they provide 35% uh, subsidy. And for that, no, I am quite happy that around 6,000 wo women have applied and got sanction also for 152 crores. So, they are going to upscale those enterprises also. So, this is the way the how the things are moving. So, not only, so what we are doing, we we are ensuring that the nutrition food is processed also because people uh, love to eat like this muffins and then breads, then pizza also. If Why can't they have pizza of this millet also? So that's why we are working on uh, these aspects also. So I think they also provide us a lot of opportunity in this direction. And uh, so I have got many things to speak, but I, no, I wouldn't take much time. I will just share one, two more things. And I feel that uh, nutrition is one, one thing, but for the farmer, the market is also very important. So, so I may say, no, no, this is very good, you should eat. He would say, where is the market? If I grow such thing, what would I do with it if I can't sell it? So, we have, are working with private companies also, like we did one experiment with Harvest Plus. They said, we will give you the fortified seed also for the wheat, pearl millet and finger millet. So last year we started with this uh, fortified zinc wheat and we worked with 34,000 farmers and we have procured 100 million tons of wheat and that has been taken by that company only. So it's a win-win situation for the farmer also and for our community resource persons also because they were trained in the package of practices for that also and the company is also happy. So it's a win-win situation for everybody. I think we need to find such solution where uh, everybody takes uh, something out of the system. So that has been quite successful. And this year we are working on this uh, finger millet also, calcium fortification. Pearl millet we are working with the iron fortification. So we have done uh, the work in this direction also. And uh, so I will just uh, leave you with one more uh, interesting story that how the women take care of the family and how they know how, how to take care of everything. So during this COVID time, so COVID time we couldn't go out. So it was becoming very difficult to tour, etc. So we used to hold this uh, virtual conferences, etc. So, so during this one of the virtual meetings, so I was interacting one with one lady from Mizoram, is the northeastern corner of India from one remote village of that area. So we were discussing about this agri nutri gardens. We support these gardens also in the backyard of the house where the women grow different type of vegetables, fruits, etc. and poultry, etc. also so, so that they get nutritious food. So I was talking with her and, uh, and I, uh, I asked her one leading question. So what benefit do you get out of this agri nutri garden? The answers she gave me, they were really an eye opener. She said, sir, we get uh, good and fresh vegetable at home only. One thing is that, because there's nothing great in that, you, you, you can get the vegetable from market also. She said, no, sir, the extra vegetable I give to my friends also in the village. So I, I, I have got a good friendship also in the village. Third thing, the extra vegetable I get, I sell in the market also. This is the third thing. Fourth thing, Sir, I saved money from the doctors also. Nobody, my children, my husband, my father, nobody goes to the doctor. So I am saving money from that also. So this is the knowledge. The people know much more than we think we know. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Singh, and thank you for reminding us of the importance of the self-help groups and the role they play. It's my privilege now to invite Ms. Anita Praveen, Secretary of the Ministry of Food Processing Industries, Government of India, to deliver the opening address. This ministry's leadership in promoting sustainable food processing and enhancing nutrition through innovative policies has been pivotal in transforming India's food systems, as well as being a growth engine for Viksit Bharat 2047, ensuring economic growth for all. Ms. Praveen. Thank you. Dignitaries on the days, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a matter of great pleasure for me to be present here today because I was reading about what sapling is all about and it is something which is very, very important for the South Asian region today. Shaping our food systems in this region is something that probably governments are working on and now with able support from initiatives as the one we are discussing today, it is going to add a lot of value. As a practitioner in the government sector, I, would, I call myself a generalist practitioner because we do not, we are not experts like many of you here. We keep learning and kind of innovating all through our career from the beginning itself. There are a few things that I learned right in the beginning and I was initially sent to the southern part of India, which is in Tamil Nadu where I had the fortune of getting two very excellent postings. One, I mean, these were all after my field postings, initial field postings. One was the Tamil Nadu Integrated Nutrition Project, which I, if there are some old World Bank hands here, they will recognize that it was supported by the World Bank. And second was the Women Development Project. This was supported by IFAD. These were, of course, two different postings. But these postings actually shaped my thoughts in various ways. The Integrated Nutrition Project is the one which later on transformed into the ICDS, the Integrated Child Development Project. Incidentally, Tamil Nadu has been pioneer in various schemes that today became nationwide um, schemes, rolled out as nationwide schemes. So this scheme started with the scheme used to handle three month to 36 month age group of children, pregnant and nursing mothers. Now, one thing that this gives, gave us was, we started taking care of the population right from the womb because the mother was given nutrition. The child after, it, after three months was given nutrition under the scheme and nursing mothers were given adequate food under our centers where they came and not just got food, they also get trained into how a child is supposed to be weighed. What should be the weight of a child as it grows? The, a card used to be issued and that card would give the mother, there was a very good visual which gave even the women who could not read to understand a comparison as to whether my child is actually growing up to the standards that it is required to be. Second one was the Women Development Project. This is, I'm, I'm an old person in the sector, so this is about 93, 94 when we were doing the Tamil Nadu Women Development Project and Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, both states, went on to expand the entire scope of the scheme that rolled out in Bangladesh for women group. I mean, it started there. It, they were the pioneers in this idea, but we took it over in the Women Development Corporation that was where I was the managing director. And we took care of, we started with five districts and rolled it out to the entire state. And today, with pride, we say that is what is the self-help groups that finally took over the entire country in its own wave. The impact that it has has been so tremendous the amazing confidence of the women once they were taught how to handle a small diary where they would write their accounts. You give a woman money and she knows how to handle it. I take pride in that, being a woman myself. <laughs> the unbelievable factor under this scheme was that the women were given loan by banks. Indian Bank collaborated with us in Tamil Nadu. And these women 
they got loans all women did not get it at one go they identified those which were ready to do a project the loans were given to them the repayments were 99.9% that 0.01 was also because someone had an in a, a kind of unexpected turn in life maybe a death in family or something but otherwise the repayment numbers were so so encouraging and the money that they contributed to the group that was utilized so properly that it used to amaze us who thought that no no we, we are people who have gone through school college education systems which have taught us so many things no these women were much more educated in real life they knew practical things in life and the way that they were i have i have actually personally visited one group multiples but this one is a quotable case where these women used to in rameshwaram they would dive into the water take out shells which they would sh sell on the sea seashore and to get into the sea they would just get into the water dive in get the seashells of course the live animals were ultimately consumed by them being fisher women community but the kind of confidence they had they in fact pulled me into the water i was scared but i went with them because you can't tell them i'm scared so i did go with them and i was amazed at the confidence they showed having found livelihood in their control was something that mattered so ladies and gentlemen what i'm trying to bring to your notice and bring to, as a learning that i had was that early intervention is what is required these two schemes were early interventions in nutrition and in livelihood today the large number of women's group that are operating in the country are a kind of network which is unbelievable they are not just small groups they are federated they are educated through the sources that the government has all governments and central government have created globally i mean i should also point out that the tamil nadu nutrition project i remember those days used to have we have to reduce infant mortality rate and i remember the targets midway were somewhere like 55 for 1000 is what we need to aim this year's tamil nadu's infant mortality rate is 8.2 which is a tremendous number i must say because achieving that means that the generation that went through this nutrition project has come up to become healthy mothers healthy people who are actually bringing great health and not just health these are the people who are great income generators globally we are dealing with two kinds of things one is a shortage of food and the other is surplus of food both are a problem in themselves i would say the second one to be a much bigger problem today but then it is in isolated regions the prosperous ones have this kind of a problem this is not something that really poor countries are dealing or the south asian region still has a lot of headroom here the right time is to intervene now and make changes with a population the size that we are handling in india we are like 1.4 billion which is not a small number i think we are 17 or 18% of the world close to 20% it's not a small number to feed and the climate change has had such an impact on not just us that is true for all over the world even the developed world is facing the impact the erraticity is something that has become so difficult we think we have all the instruments we have all the technology to make predictions no it is taking us by surprise year after year people living in delhi can vouch for it this year we had unprecedented winter when it was really cold it was very hot in summer we are still having rains this year which is which we never had in september uh, thankfully during the event rain gods have been kind to us and our event has been going on smoothly one more day to go keeping my fingers crossed but the erraticity of you know rainfall temperature the seeds that we actually are using in the field are not resilient to this kind of change yet the farmers do not have grip on this because they are still used to the old practices they are still dependent on the rainfall that used to you know fall on time and they used to sow they used to get their harvest and they were happy people but gradually the whole thing is shifting and that's a signal that we really have tampered with our environment badly and time to make rectifications probably was not even yesterday it was years ago we need to really work fast enough to 
kind of do whatever has to be done. The consequence of this will not just be lowering yield, it will be nutrition of course gets affected, but health is the next one. Because your income goes down, you stop referring to, you know, doctors, you don't have systems which take care of you. The systems don't develop in lots of areas because you need a lot of money to have medical systems functioning. And that requires your otherwise the world to run in order. If you are not in order, things are difficult for you to deal with. And so the intervention is imperative, at least now, if not earlier done. It's not just a responsibility of the South Asian population to look after the climate change is something that I would like to highlight as well. Because you see, we are entitled to some share in the progress as we are using some resources for developing. If we don't utilize the resources, we hamper development. But it remains everyone's responsibility, including the developed world, to really be supportive of this region, to go ahead and develop while we take care of the environment as well. India has taken a lot of commitments as far as the climate change is concerned. And once commitment taken, we don't we won't go back on that, we are sure of that. But it's, a, it's an uphill task for a country where you need so many people to be fed, such a large population to be not just given food, it, not just nutrition is what we are talking about, health, education, even network connectivity is an important thing today. So all these things actually befall on the government and the private sector to make sure that things reach at the, on the remotest in the remotest corner of the country. In fact, what requires to be done is that have initiatives like Sapling where you do create some kind of a policy intervention, collaborate with state governments, the uh, central governments and work the systems around the requirement that not just helps us cope with the need to comply with climate change commitment but also to ensure that development and the wheels that are going on to make India a progressive country, it doesn't stop because we can't afford to have that. The country has to develop, whether it is the, at the cost of a little bit of environment, there is something that we have a thin ice on which as a country we need to walk. We need to take care of the environmental angles as well as we need to take care of the hungry mouths. We cannot deny both the sides. But you see, when the requirements are higher on feeding people, probably that will take the priority. So this is the time to do appropriate interventions and ensure that the country is not just technically, technologically and in terms of skill empowered enough to take care of these angles as well. When our farmers are given adequate training, adequate information, the, the channels of communication to them have to be continuously working so that they are able to produce food, not just to feed their own families, but to ensure that the population is taken care of and we also stand in the export market. It's not just within the country that we need to look at because we cannot really grow beyond a point. There is a ceiling that you need to break and approach the export market as well. So that requirement is something that is an essentiality. As the Secretary of the Food Processing Industries Ministry, our role has been to create as much infrastructure in the field as possible. We do not do it ourselves. As Sharanjit Singh was informing, we actually are having a wonderful model where we engage the micro, the medium, the large, all levels of industries who create infrastructures with a little bit of support from us. We ensure that people who are creating infrastructure do not really look for the crutch of government support all through. The scheme gives them some capital subsidy, but otherwise they are trained and they are on their own to make sure that infrastructure created is used for processing, is used for adequate manpower uh, support which actually is a cause of employment. Incidentally, the sector happens to be the second largest employer in the country after textiles. And we take great pride in this, the registered as well as the non-registered categories. All put together, we are the second largest employer in the sector, in the country. 
so it is a herculean task that the ministry does with the micro entrepreneurs with the medium sized um, entrepreneurs and the large sized and they are if you will go around the f- a- a- exhibition that we have outside we have a lot of our beneficiaries who are showcasing their produce their venture and their technology all over this area in a large large uh, uh, display so my personal experience teaches me that primary processing capabilities need basically to be brought very close to the farms i always state this thing and it's a favorite one that i say that we need to carpet bomb micro enterprises which are working close to the farm and doing primary processing the secondary processing is something that can happen at a further far away place see if you have these micro microprocess- micro processors which are very close to the farm they can add as you know spokes to the hub that is the central uh, larger processors advantages that i list out here is that the positive impacts can be many in fact it's got a very major climatic impact positive impact on the climate the fuel miles saved from transporting water and the shells of the food products you actually process it to a level where you have disposed utilized or recovered a lot of water from the produce and the coatings which are basically peel or shells they can be utilized there itself into various forms you you will be amazed to see the kind of impact that this kind of technology can have our pavilion is showcasing how peel from one masala company is showing how peel from their a uh, garlic and onion has been used to make those papers which nowadays we buy with great pride in big shops you know handmade paper we call it that's made of peel it's an amazing thing the cream that they have extracted from the peel it's uh, from the seed of mangoes it's something which is amazing these are not just something that is that are being created for you know to showcase these are actually profit making ventures today because that fat that has been extracted is now used in the cosmetic industry so this is a great advantage that i see that is possible we create so much of employ- employment close to the farm we shift the burden of employment today which is sitting on the farm which is a small piece of a farmer where the entire family probably gets his income to some kind of entrepreneurship some kind of venture which yields money and more than that you save a lot of things from getting wastage wastage is another issue that we are grappling with the farther a food travels the more the wastage happens so if it is a pulp of mango is created and sealed and packed which stays on for 2 years or if onion is irradiated in a close by location and it is stored in a cold storage that's a major step that we need to really push for the next aspect aspect that the ministry is slightly concerned about is about the over nourishment which is also part of the discussions that are going to take place the obesity part is an endem- is an epidemic today but fortunately i wouldn't say fortunately that's a wrong word to use it's more an urban phenomenon the rural phenomenon is the rural population is still healthier because they are still into traditional food it's only happening where disposable income is higher the urban centers and where availability of ultra processed food is high but given the reality that food has to travel far away and to reach every household processing is inevitable i don't i can't re- ever recommend that don't process the biggest advantage of this is being taken by women who are today free to work the workforce in a household does not really need to sit and kind of grind masalas and do all kind of minor activities take packaged f- stuff and utilize it is it is the problem with the ultra pro- ultra processed which i don't think many households in india are still very used to in rural areas or s- semi urban areas that is where the problem lies and we need a lot of education that needs to go in we need to not just educate the population we also need to appeal to the industry to do responsible processing it's not a good idea to process ultra process or highly process a food and kill the nutrition that it has 
So we always engage in this kind of a dialogue with our industry members and it's a constant discussion that we have in various fora that we meet them. And I hope this will bring good results someday. The other important area that we need to, need to work on is sanitization of the raw material that we have. Unfortunately, India has to face a lot of phytosanitary issues in the international market. And that's because of, you know, pesticides being in the final product. But the, where does the pesticide keep creeping into the food? food chain is something that we need to understand. The raw material, which is your either the marine fish or uh, your grains, your chicken, whatever you produce, there is a need to kind of use a lot of sustenance related chemicals for it because we need this, this produce. We cannot really do away with it. So a balance is what we are working on and the government is engaged on this angle also. I know I've gone a little meandering because of the kind of exposure you have. You tend to go free flow on discussion of this nature. But the best part is that I'm happy to see that these issues are alive and these issues are being discussed in forum where excellent knowledgeable people are sitting here. And I hope we find a good way to make sure that our population does not just meet the climate change requirements, it handles issues which are gra they are grappling with and also get adequate nourishment, everything which is absolutely necessary. So we need to develop, but we need to conserve the environment as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Praveen. Thank you for those examples and anecdotes which made your presentation so much richer. August, it's an honor to invite you to share your thoughts for the Sapling Dialogue in line with the World Bank's work on advancing food systems and ensuring nutrition security, which is critical to achieving sustainable development goals. Thank you. Let me put my glasses. Honorable Minister Leonpo Poncho, Honorable Secretary uh, Anita, Secretary Jaranjit, and uh, Mr. Harry from SARC, uh, dear colleagues, Apana, um, Abraham, um, I see Andrew from Agriculture, I see many colleagues from the Health and um, other World Bank teams here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to address this um, gathering on this very important topic. Um, nutrition is something that we all care about. You know, over lunch today, I was thinking, you know, how, how lucky am I to be able to have lunch um, and good food um, in India? And the secretary talked about uh, the good food that we have here in India. And we tend to forget the journey that took all of us here, that took um, global community here. Nutrition has been on the mind uh, and on the agenda and perhaps not always on the plate of civilization across time. From the Stone Age to the Space Age, we've been worrying about food. Um, India is perhaps a place where this journey has been the most perhaps successful, but also the most uh, visible globally. We know that um, the Green Revolution traveled here and it is here that it took it really its significance and I'll come to it in, in a minute. Before getting to this point, I wanted to ask myself and maybe with your help, I'll get some answers, some questions. The first question that I have for myself is that you know, I was thinking about over lunch. Yes, we are fed, I'm feeding myself, but are we healthily fed? Are we healthily nourished? And we got some answers from the first few inter interventions. And I guess we could say, yes, we're eating enough, but I probably not well enough. Um, and maybe even in some part of, of the world, because of logistics, because of uh, shortages whilst the ha we have surpluses elsewhere, uh, elsewhere. 
because of storage, because of insufficient processing, before, because of insufficient uh, energy to store food, they are not well fed. We know that around the world, 149 million children under five are estimated to be stunted. Globally, 45 million children are estimated to be wasted. Nearly half of death among children under five are caused by undernutrition. At the same time, 1.9 million people, 1.9 million adults are either overweight or obese. This doesn't give me a good answer to my own question, but it makes me reflect that the nutrition agenda, whilst it's been dealt with from Stone Age to Space Age, there is still a lot of work to do. And whilst we know that many governments around the world have addressed that, and India is one of the government we know of Poshan, which is a very powerful nutrition program, and India has had many nutrition programs already, as we heard from the Secretary, and we, we've been very happy to have been associated to, to these programs from, the, from Tamil Nadu all the way to the national level uh, portion and working with institutions such as the self-help groups and uh, especially Jivika in, in, in Bihar, for example. We've been doing a lot of work. The governments have been doing a lot of work, successfully so, but we cannot rest on our laurels because as we succeed, we create other problems. As we feed ourselves, we overfeed ourselves. As we use technology to solve problems and free up time for us to do other work, this same technology creates perhaps some other uh, issues such as poor quality of the food we eat. But I was not waiting to have good answer to this question before asking myself my next question, which is, the planet is providing us food today. But how about tomorrow? Will the planet be ready and be able to provide us food tomorrow? And I think that answer doesn't depend on the planet. It depends on us, on how we use the planet to feed ourselves. Are we over-exploiting the planet? Are we damaging the future for our next generation? We know that agriculture <coughs> contributes a lot to climate change. Sometimes we're not very comfortable talking about it. We're more comfortable talking about cars polluting and you know, uh, fossil fuel polluting the environment and coal producing the environment. Food also pollutes. From its production all the way to its disposal, it pollutes. Globally, uh, about 20% of CO2 emission equivalent come from agriculture. 42% of methane emission come from agriculture. And we know methane kills. So are we feeding ourselves or killing ourselves? Or at least, perhaps, at least kidding ourselves? At the World Bank, we sharply realize that. We used to be in the business of eliminating poverty and boosting shared prosperity. And we still are in that business. But we are also, and very importantly, in the business of doing this on a livable planet. We can't create growth, we can't create prosperity if we ignore the planet. So eliminating poverty on a livable planet will require not just continuing with old practices, but also coming up with new solutions, new practices. Um, and we're learning that we're implementing some of these already in India. We have Climate Smart Agriculture Project in Maharashtra, for example, and we'll have more of that in other states. We have one health project where we think about food, but also about health and about connection between animal and human health. We have irrigation projects so that we can produce, we can help produce food without using too much water. And I really like the secretary, uh, your point on millet. I'm a millet convert, I'm totally biased. I've stopped eating wheat because it takes too much water and it's not healthy. It has been so transformed that, you know, my nutritionist tells me when you're eating wheat, you're not eating food. You're eating something else. And maybe she's right, maybe she's wrong, but I've tried millet and it's, it's, it's really nutritious. And I think maybe at the World Bank, we should think of 
as we supported millet, uh, sorry, we supported wheat and rice production, the time has come for us to also think about supporting alternatives that are kinder on the environment and have perhaps kinder also for our health. Again, I realize these are not perfect answers and maybe I'm putting too, too many uh, tough questions to this audience. And I'm doing that because I understand there are a lot of very smart people in the room and this is a forum to find solutions to things. So maybe you will help find some answers to these, uh, to these questions. So my third question is partnership. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easier one. Um, the idea here is the, my, my team tells me this is a big problem. Nobody can solve it by themselves. And, you know, it's, it's clear that because this is an agenda for everyone and many institutions are thinking about it, many governments are working on it, there are a lot of brain power behind it. But still, nobody can solve the problem by, by themselves. So the need for partnership is absolutely critical. Uh, and at the bank, we have supported collaboration um, and as I said, you know, there, there is a lot that India has done. So we've worked with India to share that knowledge with other countries. Uh, for example, we worked with India to help share its knowledge on agricultural extension with Ethiopia, and it has been incorporated in Ethiopia's own uh, policies. Um, Guinea-Bissau has benefited from innovation in the cashew uh, sector in India. Uh, and Asia's experience with Seed Without Border has accelerated the development of uh, varieties in the region and also in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this forum is an example of how we're working with many countries in South Asia to share their knowledge with India, but also perhaps to borrow some of India's uh, knowledge. And we work closely with many international organizations uh, including the Gate Foundation, with whom we're partnering here, uh, and you know the World Food Program, uh, and other regional development banks, to help address these problems and share knowledge across uh, stakeholders. The question here will be perhaps, um, how about the private sector? Can we work with the private sector to share knowledge as well? Because in the food processing industry, the governments cannot do it alone. Uh, even in agriculture and food production, government cannot do it alone. The private sector has an increasing role to play, and there's some big conglomerates globally. So can we work with them to also share their knowledge more readily with farmers, rather than always pursuing uh, the uh, you know, profits or, or the bottom line? And of course, they need to have profit in order to invest, but perhaps we can use some of the public resources to share private knowledge rather than sharing only public knowledge, because a lot of the innovations will come from the private sector. Hearing my fourth and last question, how about innovation? And for me, this is perhaps the most challenging question. You know, we are announced in space age, of course, so we have done a lot of innovation, especially in, 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 in food industry. Uh, and we were, when we were faced with the biggest challenge, the biggest nutrition challenge, the biggest, um, perhaps one of the biggest um, development challenges, which was famine, hunger in the 40s, in the 1950s, and in the 1970s in India, we came up with the Green Revolution. There was a lot of innovation behind it. You know, um, resistant seeds and other techniques, and that solved a big problem. The question is, are we ready for more innovation or do we think that we have had enough innovation? At the bank, we still believe that knowledge will drive future development. It's not just finance and it's not just doing things, it's also about really innovating. And we've come up with the World Bank Knowledge Compact which highlights the importance of collecting data, learning from current practices and past successes and past failures to foster uh, development at the local and global context. As we do that in, in Asia, we have huge opportunities because the, Asia really has everything it takes for innovation to take place. You know, we have scale, we have needs um, because of the large population, 
because of the level of development the needs are huge at the same time because of the fairly advanced level of development there are also a big foundation a big ba a, a solid basis for for innovation for technology india has sent uh, india has conquered space so you know we can innovate how do we put that innovation to solving many of the challenges that are affecting people i started asking my first question about people the second question on the planet how do we use innovation to bring people and planet together. The secretary very cogently ended her intervention by saying, when paraphrasing, apologies if I misinterpret, if we have two objectives, people and planet, and the two are in tension and in conflict, we will obviously address the people challenge first. And it is understandable. But maybe with innovation technology, we can eliminate the tension. We don't have to, uh, to accept that there is a tension between the two because ultimately the planet will have to support people. So I think we experienced Green Revolution 1.0 and I'm looking at Andre. I know if, it, if I don't talk about Green Revolution 2.0, he will ask me, what did you drink today? So this is my passion. I, India experienced the Green Revolution 1.0 in the 17 after it traveled from Mexico to here and India made it a global success with Dr. MS Swaminathan and others. I believe the time has come for India to initiate Green Revolution 2.0 to address the people and planet issue at the same time without solving the people issue by hurting the planet because that's essentially if you will agree with me that's what Green Revolution 1.0 did. We fed people by exploiting the planet and without thinking really much about the planet. Now the time has come to come up with Green Revolution 2.0. Not just to lean on the planet, but to lift the planet and carry it and hand it over to the next generation. So with that, dear friends um, and um, researchers, policy makers, I would like to conclude here by saying we are the World Bank we know we are in a very, the world is in a very challenging place, but we're not shirking our responsibilities. We want to really pursue the objective of eliminating poverty for people on a livable planet, and we'll do that by working with your government and by working with researchers and finding solutions that have worked elsewhere and scaling them up, scaling them up where the needs are and providing financing to uh, countries where financing is a, is a shortage, in shortage, and work with the global community. So I would like to close here by thanking all of you for partnering with the World Bank on, in this sapling event, and uh, I look forward to spending the next few hours here and even longer with you uh, uh, over dinner. Thank you very much. Thank you, August, and thank you for that call to action on focusing on innovation to avoid that tension between people and planet. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a matter of honor and pride on behalf of the World Bank to invite His Excellency, the Honorable Mr. Leonpo Yonten Funcho, Minister, Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock, the Royal Government of Bhutan, to share Bhutan's unique and inspiring initiatives in food systems and nutrition. As the world's first carbon negative and economically sustainable nation, Bhutan offers valuable insights into building resilient and eco-friendly food systems. Can I give it to you? Yeah, you can move the laptop, I think. Yeah, can. can I close it down? Maybe you need mm -hmm. it. Do we have online participants? Do we have online participants? <coughs> uh, fellow guests of uh, honor and speakers, distinguished uh, participants, Friends, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Uh, let me begin by asking you to
close your eyes and think of foods on your plates. When you think of food on your plate, the food that you eat tells a story. It tells a story about our culture, story about our environment, story about our livelihood, and most importantly, it tells a story about our health. But increasingly, for millions in South Asia, that plate tells a story about challenges. And we are here today because we believe in changing that story. The sapling dialogue isn't just another meeting. It is a chance to rewrite the future of food and nutrition for South Asia. It is about us. It is about policymakers, researchers, development organizations, industry players, food processors, retailers, farmers, and innovators coming together to confront the reality that the world is shifting beneath our feet and that we need to shift with it. In Bhutan, the farmers are our backbone and our heart of our nation. Like many in, across South Asia, they are navigating through a landscape of extremes, unpredictable weather patterns, rising temperatures, and devastating impacts of climate change. It is not just that the crop suffers, but the entire communities and the nation. So imagine, after a long season of hard work, watching your harvest wither away because of the storm that you never saw coming. That's the stark reality of many in South Asia. But here's the thing. We are not helpless in the face of this challenge. In fact, we are standing on the edge of massive opportunity. South Asia has deep agricultural roots, unmatched biodiversity, and wealth of traditional knowledge. And yet, we face the paradox of, as some of the speakers already mentioned, the malnutrition and rising obesity. It is time that we disrupt the old way of thinking. Food is not just food. It is health, it is our culture, and most importantly, it is an engine of our economies. And here is where, where I would like to challenge us all. Let's stop thinking in silos. When we talk about food, we're also talking about the environment. And when we talk about the trade, we're also talking about our health. So therefore, the agriculture, the health, environment, trade, all of them are related. All of them are connected, like the threads of the same fabric. So if you try to fix one without considering others, we will never get it right. So let me share a personal story about Bhutan's organic farming movement. For years, under the enlightened leadership of their majesties, the kings, we have worked very hard in preserving our natural environment, natural resources, recognizing the fact that nature is not something we conquer. It is something that we work with and we collaborate with. Today, there is a growing global demand for healthy, sustainable, and ethically produced food. So under the visionary leadership of His Majesty the King and the commitment of the current government under the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister, Bhutan seeks to tap into that market. 
Our commitment to organic farming, our biodiversity, these are not just advantages, they are our opportunities. So, why stop at Bhutan? This is where the collaboration you know, comes in. The sapling is a proof that we can think beyond borders. When we bring South Asian nations together with shared knowledge, resources, innovations, we actually unlock something bigger than any one of us alone can do. So Bhutan is not an island in this fight and neither are any of you. But let's not be theoretical. The wellness market is exploding globally. People are increasingly seeking food that does not just fill their stomach. They actually want food that nourishes, heals, and respect, most importantly, the environment. So imagine this, Bhutan's traditional food, grown organically, presented to the world that is hungry for wellness and sustainability. This is not about just the nutrition. This is not about, but it is about opening new doors and opportunities for our farmers, entrepreneurs, and most importantly, the communities. This is the gross national happiness in action, development that balances economy, environment, and culture. Now, if you're wondering what this means for today, it is very simple. Let us stop playing it very safe. Let us take bold steps. Let us innovate. And most importantly, let us commit to a future no one in South Asia is left undernourished or left behind. Imagine a world where our plates, all of our plates, tell a story of resilience, story of abundance, story of health, and story of prosperity. So today, I stand here not to tell you what Bhutan will do, but to tell you what we can do together. Thank you. So Bhutan is ready to contribute to this cause, but we cannot do it alone. This isn't about governments alone. This is about partnerships. The government, private, across the borders, and across the sectors. We have the tools, and I believe we have the knowledge. Now, we need the will. Together, we can transform South Asia's food system. Together, I believe we can ensure that next generation doesn't just inherit a better plate, but a better world. So lastly, I'd like to thank the World Bank Sapling team for this opportunity to speak at this event. And likewise, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Government of India, the Ministry of Food Processing Industries, uh, for the invitation to attend World Food uh, India 2024. Thank you so much, and I wish every one of you a great day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for your rich and valuable insights that will help shape this discourse. And we look upon your government support to provide vigor and visibility to sapling in the food and nutrition security initiatives of your country. So thank you to all the distinguished speakers for, for sharing your valuable insights. As we move forward, two key messages stand out the need for collaborative efforts to strengthen nutrition security in South Asia, and sapling go sapling's goals that may help accelerate the process. And the importance of building resilient, sustainable food systems that benefit both the people and the planet. But before we break for tea, 
We have some gifts for our distinguished guests. I would like to invite the Senior Economic Advisor, Mr. Shyam Singh Negi, to do the honours. So we're moving on to the next session. If Andrew can come over to lead us through the next one. Thank you.